And with the children dismissed, we can do adult time now. So open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to be studying in 1 Timothy after taking a little break. We find ourselves in the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy. What we have here is a, a sermon entitled Marks of a Faithful Pastor. Marks of a Faithful Pastor. If you've been with us for some time, you might feel like deja vu that we're talking about this topic again. But I think you'll see why in a moment. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, by way of reminder, this letter is written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. Paul planted this church in Ephesus many years earlier. And upon Paul's release from prison, Paul was imprisoned, and that's recorded in the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends with Paul in prison. Paul is released. He hears about problems in Ephesus. He returns there with Timothy and discovers there are problems, the very problems that, he'd warned, that he had warned about. They're actually taking place. And so Paul sets Timothy there to correct the errors. And then he leaves and he writes this letter to Timothy. This letter would be read publicly. And we see from the very last clause in the letter. At the very end of chapter 6, we read, Grace with you. And as I joke, the New American Southern translation would be grace with y'all. Because the U is plural. It was intended to be read aloud to everybody. And so the idea here then is that this letter, while it's directed to Timothy, it's directed to the entire congregation. And we can begin by reading 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then from there, we will remind ourselves of the context. And we won't read all of 1 Timothy chapter 4, but we'll just read the first six verses. So 1 Timothy chapter 4. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth." For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God in prayer. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. I don't think we'll make it that far through the text today, but I hope that you see from verse 6 this overarching theme. Yes, we have the topic of apostasy, and we have the, the topic of demonic doctrine. But the bigger picture here is that Paul is telling Timothy to constantly remind the brethren of these things. That is the main focus of this text. Constantly remind the brethren of these things. We actually see then, he says that you will be, future tense, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be. This is a a conditional idea then. If you do this, then you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Well, by way of review, just of our context... Chapter 4 follows up with, obviously, chapter 3. Chapter 3 gave us elder qualifications and deacon qualifications. So we saw elders in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Elders are those who teach in the church. There are two offices in the church, that of elders and that of deacons. Elders are those who teach. Deacons are those who assist the elders so that they can focus on teaching. We saw that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. And then in verses 14, 15, and 16, we get a purpose statement for the church. This is the church's mission and mandate, or commission and confession, if you will. We read that Paul says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What we see here is the the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to be the pillar and support of the truth. The truth is then delineated in verse 16. Jesus Christ himself, the way, the truth, the life. We see this common confession of the early church. By common confession, great is the mystery or revelation of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit 
seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Now, chapter 4, verse 1, you'll notice either the word but or the word and is the very first word in your text. If it's not there, it's because, unfortunately, whatever translation you use, the translator is determined to remove that word. There is a but or an and at the beginning of verse 1 because chapter 4 is connected with verse 3. The context is that the church is the pillar and support of the truth. And yet within that context, within the context of the church being the pillar and support of the truth, there's going to be apostasy. There's going to be apostasy. There's going to be doctrines of demons that are influencing people through the means of men. And in order to be a good minister, in order to be a good, faithful pastor, this must be pointed out to the brethren on a recurring basis. You see, in chapter 3, we had the qualifications for an elder. A qualification list, if you will. It was almost all character with one skill. And the skill was that he'd be a skilled teacher. One skill, one skill alone that he'd be a skilled teacher. But that in and of itself is not enough. Merely meeting the qualifications doesn't mean you're a good, faithful pastor. No, right here in verse 6, in pointing out these things, you will be a good servant. There are many a men who maybe meet the qualifications, but they're not good, faithful pastors. So what we're going to look at this morning is marks of a faithful pastor. You're going to see that there are actually a lot in this text. We can begin with the first mark of a faithful pastor or faithful minister is that he appeals to the Word. What that means is that he appeals to the Word of God as his source of authority. Well, where do we get that from? We get it right from the very first couple words. The Spirit explicitly says. Paul's not saying, I think, I feel, I imagine, I hope. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. The Holy Spirit is speaking. That is the authority. If, if Timothy is going to remind the brethren, what he's going to remind them of is that God has spoken, is speaking. And what we see here, just by way of, of a short rabbit trail, is the personhood of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force or an energy. He is a person. The Holy Spirit speaks. This speaks to his personhood. He is God. We serve one God and three persons. And this speaks to his personhood. This is not a force or an energy contrary to pantheism or a lot of the other theisms or even contrary to some of the Christian cults that would deny the deity of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two options that translators and interpreters have taken here with what does this mean? What did Paul mean when he said that the Spirit explicitly says? Well, the first option that many take is that this is speaking to previous revelation, written previous revelation, and that is a fair interpretation. The fact of the matter is Christ himself warned about these very things. We find it in the Gospels. We find this idea, this, this idea of apostasy and demonic influence. We find it in the book of Jude. We find it in the book of 1 John. So what we also see in the New Testament is that it is common for the New Testament writers to talk about Scripture and introduce an Old Testament quote by saying, the Holy Spirit says. It's common for the New Testament writers to quote the Old Testament and say, the Holy Spirit says. So it is a fair interpretation to say that this idea that the, the Spirit explicitly says is referring back to what he's already said multiple times. The Holy Spirit says. I don't take that interpretation. The interpretation that I take is that as Paul is sitting down, penning this letter, as the Holy Spirit is moving him along in penning this letter, the Holy Spirit is providing him present tense divine revelation and telling Paul, write this down. This is what I want you to emphasize in this letter, Paul. Either way, you come to the same conclusion. 
Either way, you come to the same conclusion. Whichever interpretation you take, the, the first mark of a faithful minister is that he appeals to the Word of God as his source of authority. Whether we're talking about previously written, written revelation or whether we're talking about new revelation Spirit was giving to Paul, by the time Paul writes this down and gives it to Timothy, when Timothy reminds the brethren of these things, he's reminding them of written revelation. The faithful minister doesn't get up here and say, I think, I feel, my personal preferences. He says, thus saith the Lord. And if he has not that to say, he has nothing to say. So, the first mark of a faithful pastor is that he appeals to the Word of God as his divine authority. And what we must mention here is that not only does he appeal to the Word of God as his authority, but he brings out what the Word of God is intends to mean. What did the Holy Spirit mean? You don't get to take the Word of God and just use it however you want. There's a great illustration and it talks about two types of preaching and the Word being like a lamp. Uh, imagine a, a street light, if you will. And there's one type of preacher and what he does is he uses the lamp to illuminate, to, to light things up. It serves its purpose. The purpose of the lamp pole is to bring light. That's one type of preacher. And another type of preacher is referred to as a drunken preacher. What he does is he leans against the lamp pole to do whatever it is he wants to do. He uses it for his own purposes. Rather than actually using it to bring light and illuminate, he leans against it as a prop. The faithful man of God does not use the Word of God as a prop. He brings out what it was that God intended to communicate to his people from the text. First Mark. Let's look at the second mark. As we read, the Spirit explicitly says, that is to say clearly or emphatically, that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Well, the faithful minister, one of the things that he does, one of his marks, is that he warns about the reality of apostasy. He warns about the reality of apostasy. This word here, will fall away, this is the Greek word apostasontai. That's where we get the idea of apostasy, apostasontai. It's the idea of departing from a previously held position. It can be used in a literal, literal sense, physical sense, or it can be used more in a, in a metaphorical sense. This was a warning that in the latter times, now that requires some interpretation, the latter times. What that speaks of is today. It speaks of today, all throughout church history, all throughout the church period, if you will. When the church began on the day of Pentecost, it was called the last days. We see that in, in Peter's sermon when he cites from the book of Joel on the day of Pentecost, that what God would begin to do in the last days. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says that God has spoken to us in these last times or these last days. 1 John 2.18, the Apostle John says that it is the last hour. Jude 18 talks about the last time. We are presently in the last days. And as we are now 2,000 years from the beginning of the church, we're really in the last days of the last days, or so it would appear. We could continue for who knows how long, but we are surely closer to the return of the Lord than we were 2,000 years ago. So during the church age, in these last times, some, not all, some will apostatize. So God, through Paul, through Timothy, to the church in Ephesus, and then to us, is warning that there are some who profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ who will fall away from the faith, and they will turn from that confession. When we were in 1 Timothy chapter 4 some weeks ago before I went on vacation, we looked at the theology of apostasy as an introduction to this chapter, a theology of apostasy. If you weren't here for that, I encourage you to go on our website and listen to that sermon, a theology of apostasy. Very quickly, the summary of this is that those who fall away were never Christians. It's a theological it's a theological conclusion that you must reach. All throughout the New Testament, what is taught is that the believer who is saved by God will be kept by God all the way until the end. 
And yet, at the same time, there are people who profess Christ that were never actually His. Matter of fact, John, the apostle of love, as he is called in 1 John 2, he actually tells us that, speaking of certain men, they went out from us because they were never really of us. But they went out so that it would be made evident that they were never really of us. The, the reality of apostasy, those who at one time identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God, but they don't actually persevere until the end. This was personified by Judas. He was with, there, with Christ, with the disciples. Nobody could tell the difference, but eventually he apostatized. If we were to read through the book of John, John chapter 6, verse 66, we see those who walked with Jesus, were referred to as his disciples, and then left. See the same thing in John 8, 40. Those who were believing in him wanted to kill him. Jesus himself spoke about this in the parable of the soils. We saw four different types of receptions to the word of God. Only one of them perseveres to the end with fruit. Two of the four eventually fall away. So the reality here is that the, the faithful minister warns his people about the reality of straying from the narrow path, the, the reality of apostatizing. Even, even Paul wrote to the Corinthians saying, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. These are people that he had seen be supposedly converted under his own ministry, and yet he had to remind them that they needed to examine themselves to see whether or not they were in the faith. Now what we see here is that in latter times, some will fall away from the Faith. There is an article here, both in the Greek text and in the English. They fall away from the faith. What we're talking about then here is an objective, defined body of doctrine. It is the faith. It's not falling away from, from some ambiguous you know, confession that they've made. What this is saying is that there is the faith. It is articulated. It is defined. It is objective. And it is from that that they fall away. This idea is all throughout Scripture. We could look right here in this very letter. If you look at chapter 1, verse 3, Paul gives us one of his two purpose statements. We read a purpose statement back in verse 14 of chapter 3 when Paul said, I'm writing these things so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. But here he gives a purpose statement in leaving Timothy behind in Ephesus. He says, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. So, in order to have strange doctrines, in order to identify what those strange doctrines are, and in order to be able to say those are strange doctrines, you may not teach them, you have to be able to compare them to an objective standard. You have to have an objective, organized, systemized standard that says this is orthodox Christianity. What you're teaching is strange, heterodox, heresy. You may not teach that. We see that in one very important place. If you were to go to the book of Jude, I'll just read very quickly so you don't have to turn there. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Jude wanted to write and encourage his brothers and sisters, but the Holy Spirit compelled him to write that they would contend earnestly for the faith, the faith that's been handed down once for all. That's it. There's no more new revelation to add. This is it. It's organized, systematized, and it is an objective body of doctrine. And we even began to look at this topic in our men's study as we looked at the biblical justification for what we call systematic theology. How is it that we defend systematic theology? Well, it's because in multiple places in the New Testament, the writers talk about a form of doctrine, how we are to hold to the form, which means a, a press, an imprint. There is a clearly defined body of doctrine. And in the church age, there will be those who profess to believe that body of doctrine and yet will follow all the way from the faith. Now, what's important to note, though, you cannot fall away from that which you did not have to begin with. 
You can't fall off of a mountain you were never on. You can't give up and retreat from a position that you never held. The reality is that there are many in the church who don't even know what the gospel is. They don't know what objective sound doctrine is. They've never held it to begin with. I could give you just an example from this week. It's a sad example, but it's an important example. There is a famous megachurch pastor who wrote a book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, a pastor named Josh Harris, very famous pastor. And just this week, he admitted in his own words that by all standards he has to examine himself, he is not a Christian. He's called himself an apostate. And for many, this is not a surprise, because as you go back to this I Kissed Dating Goodbye book, you can see that it's actually a, a distortion of Scripture. It's a collection of legalism, a collection of lists and rules. And sure, some people benefited from it, but many people were harmed greatly by it, such that even just a year ago he had come out and, and said he wished he'd never written the book because he'd made a lot of errors. And what's always consistent is if somebody doesn't originally hold to orthodox doctrine, don't expect them to stay there. They can't stay there if they don't hold it. And so for those that had read the book with a discerning eye, understanding what the Word of God teaches, he was off right from the very beginning. And it was only a matter of time that the trajectory became more and more clear. So even a pastor of a mega church, you have to test him. You have to test him because people do depart. And there are false gospels being taught. There are many. If you ask, what is the gospel? They can't articulate the gospel. They can't even fall away from the faith because they don't actually know the faith. So that was our second point here. The second point is that the faithful pastor, the faithful pastor warns his people of the reality of apostasy. I'll turn back over here into 1 Timothy again. We'll get to our, our third point. The Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith. Brings us to our next point. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. The faithful pastor directs God's people to spiritual realities. Do you see where these doctrines come from? They're not the invention of men. They're not the invention of men. What's going on inside the church is deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So, Scripture paints that there are two ways for all of humanity. There are two ways. There are two paths. There are two destinations. There are two lords. And there are also two planes in which we exist. We exist on the physical, but we also exist in the spiritual realm. There is a spiritual realm around us at all times. There's a lot of good illustrations for that. One might be a, a Wi-Fi network. Nobody here can see the Wi-Fi network. Nobody can feel it. Nobody can hear it. But if you get out your phone and you look, you'll see that there is a Wi-Fi network in this room where there's information being transmitted should you so choose. Well, so it is in every church. So it is in all of life. There is a physical, but there also is a spiritual. And so the faithful pastor is always reminding God's people to think spiritually. And that's what Timothy would be doing. In order to be a, a good servant, he has to point these things out to the brethren. What things? That these doctrines are coming from Satan. They're coming from Satan. Now, this should be self-evident, really, for anybody that's read their Bible, if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, where did the first errors come from? Satan. It was spiritual. It wasn't merely just physical. It was Satan in the garden addressing Adam and Eve. Spiritual reality is always present. We think about Ephesians. Last week in our scripture reading, we read Ephesians chapter 6. I'll remind you what chapter 6 verse 12 says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are engaged in a warfare. We are engaged in a battle, a spiritual battle. Too many people are AWOL. They're absent without leave. They've never, never even checked in for some, and for some they're just asleep on the job while brothers and sisters are getting mowed down 
Everybody's off collecting seashells. We are engaged in a spiritual war. Turn over to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see a couple texts here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're just going to look at a couple of verses quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When you articulate the gospel to the unbelieving world, you need to understand what's happening. 2 Corinthians 4.3, Paul says, And even if our gospel is veiled, and it is to some, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Talk to me about free will when you can talk to me about how it is that they can remove the, the veil that Satan has put upon them. They're spiritually blind. It is a spiritual warfare. Turn over to chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3. I am afraid as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Just as the serpent deceived Eve, I am afraid that you too will be deceived. We could turn over. Verse 13, Paul's talking about those who had moved into the church in Corinth after Paul left to continue his missionary journey. He writes about these men, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Do you see this? That Satan is actively involved in disguising himself. And then he has servants who then disguise themselves and infiltrate churches. But it's spiritual. It's not merely physical. We looked at this just last week in Psalm 2. In Psalm 2, we saw that the nations are raging. The kings of the earth are gathering together to cast off the bands of God. It's against God that they're rebelling. It's not just a mutiny against other kings. It is against God. It is spiritual in nature lest you not be convinced completely. I want you to see the black and white nature of what I am saying to you. Turn over to the book of James. Go past Paul's letters into the book of Hebrews, past Hebrews, and you'll see the book of James. James chapter 3. Easy verse to just kind of read over and not understand the implications. Chapter 3, verse 15 We'll begin in 13, because I want you to see the, the contrast. It's an A and a B. There's only two. He says, who, is, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him, show his good, let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. There are only two types of wisdom in this world. There's nothing neutral. There is that which comes down from above, and then there is everything else. Everything else is demonic. It all goes back to Genesis chapter 3. There is nothing neutral. I'll give you an example. This might sound a little extreme. I was in a relative's household, and they had a book out uh, on the Dalai Lama. The book was out. It was about the Dalai Lama, and the uh, title of the book or part of his name maybe was His Holiness. And I took serious issue with that. The reality is that you think about the Dalai Lama, who is the leader of a, of a false religion. You're talking about a man who's personally responsible for leading billions of people into hell. This is one of the most evil, wicked men to ever walk the face of the earth. Hitler's got nothing on him. You're talking about a man who's led people into hell, and that's his purpose on earth. He is a servant of Satan. Do you understand the implications here? This is nothing where it's just no big deal. You've got your truth. I've got my truth. It either comes down from the king of kings, the father of lights, or it comes up from Satan out of the pit of hell. 
the faithful man of God, draws your attention to spiritual realities. Think spiritually, guys and gals. Now, let's look at the next one here. I think we're on it already. Look what he uses. Look what Satan uses. If you've moved out of 1 Timothy, go ahead and, and go back. The faithful pastor, he warns people. Not only that there are spiritual realities involved here, not only does he tell you to think spiritually, but he points out to you that Satan uses means. And what are the means? Men. Satan uses men. So the faithful pastor, we could summarize it this way, the faithful pastor protects against wolves. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ defined them. Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 1. Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. They're not marching around with a devil tail and a fork and a forked tongue. How ridiculous would that be? No. They are dressed like you and I, claiming to be one of us. It's the Lord's own words. So what we see here, the Spirit explicitly says in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Satan uses human means. We saw that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We just talked about the Lord speaking about it in Matthew chapter 7. Now, some interesting terminology here. The hypocrisy of liars, they're actually hypocritical liars. It's two categories. So we're talking about people that pretend to be one thing and they're not. That's what the Greek word under hypocrisy originally meant. It referred to actors. Actors who'd go on a stage and put on a mask. Not necessarily deceitful in and of itself, but those who pretend to be something that they're not. That's what an actor was. So these are hypocrites who are also liars. Now, this word here that says they are seared, we talked about this in our, in our theology of apostasy. This word for seared is where we get the English word for cauterize. When you cauterize a nerve, you burn it. You burn it to the point that it will no longer feel. It's like a third degree burn on your skin, on your hands. Your nerves are just shot and you can no longer feel. And that's what's happening with these men. These men's consciences are seared as with a branding iron. Now, we've got to keep in mind the context. The context of their conscience is doctrine. This doesn't mean they beat their wives and children and kick the neighbor's dog. Remember, they're pretending to be sheep. Think of a Mormon. Mormon missionaries. Are they not the most kind, gentle, happy, helpful people you've ever met? They really are. The area in which they're seared in their conscience relates to doctrine and to truth. It's not to say that they're just wicked and evil all the way around in every area that you can observe. They're not because then they wouldn't be believable. Their conscience is seared so that they can feel nothing as it relates to doctrine. So, they might have a great family relationship. They might have a great relationship in their community and a great model life in the church. But when it comes to doctrine, their consciences are seared. Now, this conscience is a topic we've talked about multiple times, but since we bring it up here in the text, we talk about it again. Now, this word for conscience is a compound word in the Greek, and it means with knowledge. With knowledge. So, the idea here then is that every man, woman, and child has been given a conscience by God. It's part of being created in the image of God. But we know that all people who are created in the image of God are also fallen. And we understand that men are totally depraved. Now, totally depraved doesn't mean that men are as bad as they could be. What it means is that sin has affected the totality of their being. There's no part of their being that is not affected by sin. That includes their conscience. All people's consciences are fallen. But the conscience, with knowledge, functions, imagine a fire alarm. It functions like a fire alarm to let you know when something is seriously wrong. But 
As you know, with a fire alarm, sometimes it goes off when it's not supposed to, right? But there's other times when it doesn't go off when it should. And so it is with the conscience. There can be a faulty alarm that's either too sensitive. There can be a faulty alarm that's not sensitive enough. But it is the conscience that tells people right from wrong. And if they get it seared in different areas, then they can no longer discern right from wrong. Right right from wrong. Now, it comes from the image of God because we're made in the image of God, but it's fallen. Therefore, it is unreliable. Therefore, it must be trained. It can only be trained by the Word of God. It is the Word of God that calibrates the conscience. That's why a text like Romans 12.1 is so important. I'll turn there so that you don't have to. Romans 12.1, if you don't know the text off the top of your head as I mention it, then you do need to turn there, underline it, memorize it. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Conformed speaks to external conformity. It's like being put into a press. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed is the Greek word from which we get the English word metamorphosis. It is an inward transformation, like a butterfly goes into, a, or a, a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, comes out a butterfly. It is internal and it manifests externally. But the world is always teaching us to conform. Take off all the sharp edges, fit in. No, no, no. Don't conform to this world. Rather, be transformed internally by what? By renewing your mind. By renewing your mind. So the conscience, because it is unreliable, it must be trained. It can only be trained by the Word of God. And so the idea here then, sound doctrine functions like a filter. It functions like a filter. When you have sound doctrine, it prevents error from coming in because that filter catches it. But error is like a, a painkiller. A painkiller numbs your senses so that you don't feel things that you should. And slowly what will happen is your conscience will be numbed and eventually cauterized. This idea of a conscience is prevalent in Paul's writings. I wish I had the time today to do a whole series on the conscience, but I just want to look at it here in this book in 1 Timothy, and I think you'll see some of these pieces being tied together. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. So we had these false teachers who were in Ephesus that Timothy is to shut down. They're not to teach strange doctrines, nor, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, nor are they to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise, that is, what they're teaching produces mere speculation rather than the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction, what is the goal of our instruction? It is love that comes out of three things, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. It is the Word of God that produces a cleansed heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. You cannot have a sincere faith without the unadulterated Word of God. You must have the pure Word of God in order to have a sincere faith. And then if you have a sincere faith through the Word of God, you can also have a cleansed heart. That's exactly the promise of the New Covenant. When Jesus did the Last Supper... When we celebrate communion, we're talking about the new covenant. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. This is the, the blood of the new covenant. You go back to Ezekiel 36. You go to Jeremiah where the new covenant is promised. It's a new heart and a new spirit. So we have this cleansed heart. But what I particularly want you to pay attention to is the fact that a good conscience and a sincere faith are working in tandem right here because we're going to see that again. Look down to verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Keeping what? Keeping faith and a good conscience. Keeping faith and a good conscience. They run parallel. It is the faith that creates a good conscience. Look at 
The faith is what creates, protects, and prefects, perfects, I'm sorry, a clear and good conscience. It is the faith that creates, protects, and perfects a good conscience. One observation we can make from this text here is that a faithful pastor calls wolves by name when necessary. You see it right there in verse 20. Keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwrecked in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. I don't exactly know who Hymenaeus and Alexander are, but the Ephesians did. They knew exactly who these men were, and Paul called them by name. There's a great quote that I am particularly fond of because it articulates this. A pastor's heart is not manifest in how good a man is at petting sheep. A pastor's heart is manifest in how capable he is at protecting them from wolves. Children can, can go into a petting zoo and pet sheep. That is not the proof of a pastor's heart. A pastor's heart is manifest in his ability to protect them from the wolves. Because when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and you give an account, the kindness of your pastor will be irrelevant. How gentle he was will be irrelevant. If he invited you over to his house for dinner will be irrelevant. How personable he was will be irrelevant. But if he kept the wolves away from you, that'll make all the difference in the world. Did he protect you from error? Because let me tell you, error, even in the life of a believer, can have unmitigated damage. Think about this. Well, I won't go there. Think about what happens when a believer commits adultery. What are the consequences of that for his parents or her parents, for their spouse, for their spouse's family, for their children, for their children's children, for the people in the community that know they profess Christ? Error is cancer. It has to be dealt with and eradicated. So, the faithful pastor warns about wolves because Satan uses means. Satan uses means. Now, the next mark of a faithful pastor, right here in this text, the Spirit explicitly says, and in a latter time, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own consciences with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. A faithful pastor exposes heresy. A faithful pastor exposes heresy. He's not silent on it. He doesn't look the other way. He doesn't agree to disagree. He exposes heresy. Now, note, there's very little said about this heresy here. We don't exactly know what they were teaching. That's the truth in every single letter that we have in the New Testament. Did you know that virtually every letter in the New Testament is written to correct heresy and theological error and false teachers? Go through it and you'll find that that's the impetuous behind virtually every letter. But it's always very, very difficult to piece together the heresy because that's not what a faithful shepherd does. And I'll get there in a minute. But for now, the point to make from this text is that the faithful shepherd exposes heresy. He doesn't give a lengthy treatise on it, just enough to make it clear what we're talking about. And so we don't know exactly what Paul was talking about to the Ephesians. We can make some observations. These were men who they were forbidding marriage, and they were advocating abstaining from certain foods that God had created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. We can piece together some ideas, potentially, from this very letter. We see from chapter 1 that these false teachers, verse 7, they wanted to be teachers of the law, even though they didn't understand what they were talking about. So it sounds like, like a lot of the other heresies, they were seeking to bring people under some form of the Mosaic law. And you'll see that these patterns here actually run all throughout church history. The forbidding of marriage and abstaining from foods. The largest Christian denomination in the world, the Roman Catholic Church, is marked by these two things. Priests have to be celibate, and you don't eat meat on Fridays. I mean, right out of the book. But if you don't read the book, you won't know. <laughs> 
but there's been this error regurgitated throughout church history, which is why church history is important, because nothing's new under the sun. Every heresy is the same heresy repackaged under a new name. The Essenes, they're a kind of famous Jewish sect. They practiced this very thing of remaining celibate. So did the monks. They practiced being celibate. Even more soon in, in, in our days, we had the Shakers. The Shakers were an offshoot of the Quakers. So the, the, you had the, what were called the Shaker Quakers because they started out as Quakers and moved into to Shakers. They were categorized. Their worship services, you can go read it on Wikipedia even, their, their worship services were categorized by charismatic outbursts, Egalitarianism. Egalitarianism says that there's no distinction between functions in the church between men and women. That God doesn't care whether it's a man or a woman that does things in the church. They're characterized by charismania, egalitarianism, new revelation, and celibacy. I mean, that's just, it's right out of the text. But there are many that, that still teach this. You think about uh, Seventh-day Adventists, another cult. They teach a certain diet. You must fall under that diet. It's very common. Paul doesn't give us all the details, but just enough to know what he's talking about. And so for us, what we can do is we can see how it is that he exposes it. That's what we need to know. We don't need to know exactly what the heresy was. We need to see how he exposes it and the fact that he exposes it. So faithful pastors expose heresy. Let me give you another point here. He makes commentary, Paul does. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now, verse 4 begins with the word for. It's an argument. Whenever you see the word for, he's, he's proving or disproving something that was previously said. He's substantiating something that was previously said. But we're not going to get there just yet. We're not going to actually get to his line of argument. First, we're just going to look at his observation because his observation is important. The faithful pastor models a biblical worldview. Let me unpack that for you. A faithful pastor models a biblical worldview. What I mean by that is look how he comments. As he's describing the heresy, he's able to just quickly note what it is that's being talked about. They forbid marriage and foods, things which God has created to be gratefully shared in. He's just giving commentary, revealing that he has a biblical worldview. So, as, as by way of an illustration, imagine um, you're walking down the street. You can be walking down the street, and there are certain, uh, I don't even want to say types of people, there are certain situations you might see in the street as you're walking down the street and you determine, you know what, I think I'm going to go on the other side of the street. Or, I might turn around and go back the other way. You didn't have to stop and think about it. Okay. Two, three guys, this is going on. It came natural to you. It was so ingrained in your worldview that you saw it, you recognized what it was, and you changed. That's a biblical worldview. What's happening with Paul here is he's just able to make quick observation. Look, these guys are prohibiting things. They're the things that God has created to be gratefully shared in. It's a biblical worldview that at first glance, you have such a foundational subconscious understanding of what God's word teaches that at first glance, you're able to correctly and quickly categorize things very quickly. Just like walking down the street, you turn a corner. Oh, I'm going to keep going. That's exactly what Paul is able to do here. It's because he understands the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. How many times does God say what he created is good? Over and over and over. Um, Mark 17, I'll just read it for you. Sometimes there's some confusion on this. We have uh, a movement, uh, I don't want to necessarily call it Christian, there are some Christians in it, called Torah keepers, and they want to keep the Mosaic Law. Which is interesting because they don't travel to Jerusalem, they don't sacrifice a lamb, so they're selective Torah keepers. 
Mark chapter 7. I'll just begin in 14. After he called the crowd to himself, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, when he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated? And then we see this interesting commentary inspired by the Holy Spirit. Thus he declared all foods clean. All foods are clean. If that's not enough, you see Acts chapter 11. Peter gets a vision. We don't have time to cover it in detail, but needless to say, Peter's told, told, go kill and eat. And he sees all of these creatures being let down in this sheet from heaven. And Peter understands rightly, no, I've never put anything unclean into my mouth. Peter, go kill and eat. And don't you dare call unclean what God has called clean. And then in Acts chapter 15, we get the Judaizers who are trying to bring the believers into bondage to the Mosaic law. And what do the apostles decide at the very first church council? No, believers are not bound to the Mosaic law. And so Paul has an underlying, almost subconscious, if you will, biblical worldview. And he models it right here in the text by just being able to provide really quick commentary on what it is. He hasn't even actually engaged in his argument yet. He's just able to read it and discern. And so your faithful pastor models that for you, that he's thinking about everything biblically. Every statement, every word, every deed, every proposition quickly is evaluated through a biblical grid. So if we turn back here to 1 Timothy... Things which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. And then he begins with his actual argument. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by the means of the word of God and prayer. Now, we don't have time this morning to continue on and unpack Paul's line of argument. We're going to do that next week, and we'll continue through the text next week. But I do want to draw you to verse 6, which is where we get our sermon title from. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will, future tense, be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you've been following. Interesting distinction between the faith and sound doctrine. The point being, though, in verse 6, he says, in pointing out these things, this is a word to, to set before. It means to place before, to remind, to bring to remembrance. It is not command. There is a way to say that. It is not even to teach. The idea here is that you just keep bringing this up, and it's continuous action. It's in the present tense. So there's different types of, well, there's only one type of present tense, but it can be punctiliar. It can be ongoing. The idea here is that in order to be a faithful minister, a faithful servant, a faithful pastor, you must in some ongoing fashion bring up these things to the brethren. Then and only then will you be a good pastor. Pastor, having the qualifications in chapter 3 is not enough. They are the bare minimums. It's like going to a job interview. Yes, you meet the qualifications to show up for the interview, but that doesn't mean you're going to get hired. And unfortunately, too many have been hired into this role. Because the reality is that there is a spiritual war going on. There is a spiritual war going on for your minds. There is a spiritual war going on in the very church. And so every man, woman, and child in the church needs to be trained to evaluate what the teachers are saying. Need to be Bereans. If you don't know what that means, find the Bereans in the book of Acts. They're commended. They're commended because they listened very carefully to what Paul said. 
And then they examined the scriptures carefully to see if what he was saying was true. And that's what everybody here needs to do. Everybody here needs to be able to go to the word of God and test what I have said to you today. So part of being a faithful pastor, remember I said, is he directs people to what? The word of God. That is the only authority. So the reality, keep your mind on spiritual realities. Remember that there are wolves. The only authority is the word of God. And you need a biblical worldview that is so tight that error is automatically caught. And look for those things in those who teach you and strive for those things yourself. It is not the job of the pastor or the elder to always spoon feed everybody. We're supposed to grow up into maturity and be able to eat meat, not just milk. So, let's pray.